wave interference is a very important part of sound waves, uh, and it's what allows most of our instruments to work. So we want to take a look at interference and how that works. To do that, let's imagine a string that's fixed at both ends, something like that. And then if we pluck that string, maybe we create a wave that looks something like that. And then when we reach this fixed boundary over here on the right side, okay, what's going to happen is that this wave is going to get reflected back along the string, uh, but it's going to get reflected exactly opposite. And when it does that, what happens is that our wave is perfectly mirrored and we end up with uh, basically no wave at all, right? So it's a, something called superposition where the waves are going to add together their amplitudes at every point, and if they're exactly opposite of each other, the result of adding these two waves together would be nothing because they're canceling each other out at every point. This is called destructive interference. Okay, Destructive interference. We can have another type of interference, so let's take this wave, and then let's say we actually add to this wave by creating another wave on that same string that is exactly the same, or more or less exactly the same. And what's going to happen is at every point, again, these are going to add together, except now they're all on the same side of the equilibrium, so we end up with something that's more like this. This is called constructive interference. Okay, So we can have constructive and destructive interference. And the way those waves interfere with each other, the way we get combinations of constructive and destructive interference, uh, sort of determines what, what our ultimate wave, what this sort of final shape of this wave looks like. And it's through uh, destructive and constructive interference that we can create things like standing waves in tubes, which is what we'll look at next. So to think about a standing wave, let's picture again a wave on a string that's just like this. And then we take our hand on this end, and while it's fixed at the other end, and we're going to kind of wiggle this up and down at a regular rate. And what's going to happen is we're going to create a stand, if we do it at the right frequency uh, that matches what we call one of the, the fundamental frequencies or harmonics of the string, <coughs> then we'll create what's called a standing wave. And so a standing wave resulting from constructive and destructive interference. Okay, if we have our wave that comes down, it maybe looks something like that. Uh, and then we can draw its mirror image like this. Now this is not destructive interference here, so it's not the same thing that I drew just a little bit ago. Uh, what's happening here is that at this point here, I have constructive interference where my the waves that that is being produced and is on the string is matching what I'm doing over here where I'm shaking it up and down. And so that causes to add together and so we get a big back and forth motion here. So the, the pink just represents the motion one way, the blue the motion the other way. And so we get an up and down motion here. Whereas here, we get deconstructive interference where things are going to cancel out and there's going to be no motion here. So where there's the most motion in a wave, we call that an anti-node. in here, a node. So a node is where we have no motion in our wave, and anti-node is where we have the most possible motion. So in this wave, I have three anti-nodes and four nodes. Right? These fixed ends count as nodes, so one, two, three, four nodes there. So a lot of the instruments we use can be made up of something called a closed pipe. Uh, a closed pipe, despite what it sounds, is only closed on one end. So it's going to look something like that. And so by forcing air in one side or another, right? maybe picture like a, a reed instrument or something, we're forcing air in this side, and then we're open on this side. The way the air is going to behave in here is going to be just like the string that we saw before, where we're going to set up nodes and anti-nodes, and we're going to have a standing wave inside this uh, pipe. A couple things we have to keep in mind here, if we're drawing the wave inside the pipe, at this closed end here, air is not going to be able to move back and forth very well here because it runs up against a barrier. However, here, it's going to have to move back and forth a lot because it's going to have to adjust to the air outside of the pipe. So with a closed pipe, we're always going to have a node here and an anti-node at this end and some combination of nodes and anti-nodes in the middle. 
So the first wave that we could draw inside a closed pipe actually looks something like that, okay? Where we have our node there and our anti-node. And if we kind of look at this, uh, if we were to look at the pipe being a length L, then the wavelength of this wave, right, I have kind of a, in here, a quarter of a wavelength, right? A full wavelength would go up, down, and back up. So I have just about a quarter of a wavelength. So the wavelength here, or a quarter of a wavelength inside the tube. So the total wavelength would actually be four times the length of the tube. And this is the lowest possible wavelength we can have inside a closed pipe. Now remember that velocity is equal to frequency times wavelength, so if I wanted to find the frequency in this tube, then that would be, you know, just solve here, velocity over 4L. So now what I'm going to do is bring up a, a picture from our book and we'll look at how this pattern sort of continues. So here's the picture from our book of a closed tube, and so notice at every point we have a node and an anti-node, node, anti-node, node, anti-node. Anti so always an anti-node at the end, always a node at the closed end, anti-node at the open. So we're following the same pattern. And if we look here, okay, we have kind of a, a pattern here. Our first wavelength, 4L, our second wavelength, 4 thirds L, 4 fifths L, 4 sevenths L. And then if we go down here to fundamental frequency, it's V over 4L, 3V over 4L, 5V over 4L, 7V. Notice. 1, 3, 5, 7 is a pretty good pattern all over 4L. Okay, So we can make a general equation for any closed pipe that says the frequency of any particular what we call harmonic, so the harmonic is 1, 2, 3, 4, so on and so forth. Okay, So the harmonic is just the number. So Fn equals Nv over 4L, where N is going to be our harmonic number, and for a closed pipe, it's odd numbers, 1, 3, 5, so on and so forth. So our first harmonic, which we call our fundamental, okay, is we plug in 1, and so that's V over 4L. For our first overtone, or our second harmonic, we plug in a harmonic number of 3, so we get 3V over 4L. 5v over 4l, 7v over 4l, and so on and so forth. Now when we play an instrument, right, this is the, the frequency, the fundamental, is the harmonic that is the most heard frequency. These other ones are all present in that sound, all at the same time, but this one is the most heard. And by using things like keys or anything on an instrument, what we're doing is we're actually changing the length of this pipe. And so that's going to change the frequency we produce, and that's how you can produce different notes on an instrument. An open pipe, on the other hand, works slightly different than our closed pipe. Um, remember that we have to have an anti-node at each end of our pipe. So that means that our fundamental frequency, our lowest, longest possible wavelength, lowest frequency, would look something like this. Uh, so that we have an anti-node right, at each end here, and we have our node in the middle. Again, this would be the length of our pipe, and so if we wanted to know the wavelength of this fundamental frequency, well, that if half of our wavelength fits in the pipe, then the full wavelength is twice the length of the pipe. And then our frequency would be V over 2L, in a very similar way to how we figured out for the closed pipe. So if you take a look at the same pattern from our book uh, for an open pipe, we see that we get something slightly different. Right, remember down here we had, you know, one, three, five, seven, we had all the odd values. Uh, if we look at this and kind of how they've reduced their fractions here, this would be one over two, two over two, three over two, and four over two. So it's one, two, three, four as our coefficients on the top part. So our equation for our harmonic series, right, all of the possible harmonics that can be produced, instead of NV over 4L, would be nv over 2l, and n in this case, instead of being odd numbers, will be all of our numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, so on and so forth, 5, 6, 7, and that would complete our entire harmonic series for an open pipe.